This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everyone, I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. And together we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Crimes and Consequences. I am Tanya. And I'm Talia. And we are just a couple of friends who are lawyers and also enjoy talking true about true crime. crime. Yes, yes, a lot. A lot. So a lot. before I get into today's episode, I just would like to ask everyone to please hit the subscribe, follow, like button, wherever you are listening or on whatever app. Uh, I would like to thank True Crime Daily for hosting us. Thank and you. today's story is about the murder of Rebecca Watts. Rebecca Watts. And it takes place in England. So Rebecca Watts was born on June 3rd, 1998 in Bristol, United Kingdom. Her parents were Tanya Watts and Darren Galsworthy. Galsworthy. Life wasn't easy for Becky. Like, she just had a hard life. She struggled a lot during her childhood. Uh, before she was born, her parents had split up. And she spent the first years of her life in the care of her mom, Tanya. I don't know this story. No, I didn't know this story either until um, until today. Well, not today, but you know, <laughs> what, I, <laughs> you know today. what I mean. You know what I mean. By the time she was two, there were concerns that Becky was being neglected by her mom. And so she was placed with her father, Darren. And by this time, Darren had gotten married and his wife's name was Angie. So she's being placed in a home with her dad and her stepmother. Angie, at the time, she had a son who was about 12 years older than okay. Becky. Okay. So like 14? Yeah. How old is about Becky? Four. Becky's, she was placed there when she was about two. So he's like 14 at the time. And so they have this blended family. And by the time Becky was in elementary school... Like I said, she struggled. She struggled a lot, like her entire life. She was so shy, and she really had a problem, even in school, just even doing normal day-to-day tasks. Like social anxiety? Yeah, like social anxiety. She just, it was incredibly hard for her to just have like a normal day as a kid. Her stepmom, Angie, ended up being hired as a volunteer classroom helper so that Becky would be calm enough, you know, and more comfortable with having her there with having her there. She became really attached to Angie. Like she just clung to her. She didn't want to go anywhere without her. And when she reached about middle school age, she was really teased a lot by her, um, by her classmates due to her weight, which then, um, she became anorexic because of it by so the time she was 13 was she overweight and then she was overweight but she wasn't like i you know kids, kids are, are just assholes yeah kids they are just, just assholes she could have been five pounds you. overweight and they would have teased her right i mean okay. yeah you know how girls are you know how teenage girls are yeah i do i mean I unfortunately we all experienced it one. and the anxiety and everything became so great and she's dealing with this eating disorder that by the time she's 13 she was became homeschooled. And these were just dark times for Becky. Um, <clears throat> you know, she's she's going through this de- eating disorder, so she's seeing a lot of medical professionals. There's turmoil at home. There's turmoil, you know, because she isn't going to school. She's being homeschooled. So it, it's just a lot of, I guess, you know, just stress. Turmoil. Yeah, stress and turmoil happening at the home. However, as time went on, Becky seemed to come out of her shell a little bit, you know, being homeschooled and she was going to therapy and things like that to address her um, eating disorder. So she became, you know, her confidence is starting to build. Okay. She's getting over these things and she grew to love fashion and music, like any typical teenager. And our story takes place. Becky's about 16. Okay. Okay. So she, you know, she was described as being someone who was, um, fun and um, lovable and, you know, all the good things that you would talk about a teenager. 
but sometimes she would. Not a lot of good things I would talk about. I know. As a teenager, <laughs> but go ahead. And and you're right because there were times where she would get into tiffs with her parents, with Angie and her dad, as a mom of many teenagers. <laughs> I'm and, a professional. <laughs> I can give my opinion. Yes, you can give your opinion on teenage girls. Teenagers scare teenage me. Teenage girls especially. They scare me. Yeah. <laughs> Although things improved for Becky over her teenage years, she was still struggling with her mental health, um, carried from things from her childhood. I mean, like I told you, she was taken away from her mom. Did she see her, her dad. mom at all? I don't believe this? she saw her mom. No. And she, over about three years prior to this story... Uh, so maybe when she's about 13, um, Becky was seen by over 17 different mental health professionals. And they're all giving their diagnoses. That's a lot. It's a lot. And a lot of them, um, in my research I found out, determined that she was just like a difficult child. And even though, <laughs> even though she was voicing concerns, like she was saying like her stepbrother was a problem like he was teasing her a lot like she would mention this and they're just like oh you're just a problem child is basically maybe it's her temperament or something which she's born with. yeah i'm not sure but anxiety even though she had all of these opinions they just continue to say becky's just problematic okay okay it's her and not anyone else no one really took the time to uncover you know, like she's, I told you, she she wasn't going to school, so she's got the social anxiety, she's isolated, she, you know, had this, this eating disorder. disorder. Right, and like no one is really digging deep into like any kind of therapeutic, like a deep therapeutic environment to like really what's really uncover. going on underneath right. so, all this. Right, so what is really going on? She never did return to school. She was continued to be um, homeschooled. By Angie? Mm-hmm. And she did open up that she was just scared to be alone. And I don't know if school would trigger that because there's kids everywhere. But I think it was more like she wanted to be with someone that she knew. Knew, right. And that gave her comfort. Um, at one point, Becky reported to professionals, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, about the conflict she was having with her stepbrother, Nathan. She said Nathan would often bully her about her weight um, and... You know, I don't know how much more she went into it, but they they were like oil and water. At this time, though, Nathan has to be about in his 20s. Yeah, he's in his later 20s. He's still living at home? He's not living at home like when she's 16, but I'm thinking I don't know how how late he lived at home, like until what age. But she might even be referring to when she was younger. Okay. Um, I mean, like the eating disorder came out when she was about 13 when she developed anorexia. So I don't know if he was still at home then. Or just always stopping by and yeah. harassing her. Because he didn't live very far away, um, maybe like a mile away. But they were just, they never got along. It was like oil and water. Um, because she didn't go back to school, you would ask me, did Angie teach her? She was also taught by the Hospital Education Service, which is something that's offered in the UK. Oh. It's called HES. And it's schooling for students who are in the hospital. And it must be referred by a community-based healthcare provider. So it's something like you have to qualify for to receive. And even that, she, even though she was getting being taught by the HES, she still struggled with peer relationships. Um, and she did confide in an HES professional that there was um, a younger male student at the school who was threatening to expose her and post naked pictures of her online. And I don't know how he got these pictures. So, but Such his homeschool. I know, but she's attending the school with the hospital um, uh, professionals, and somehow he has these photos and he's threatening to expose her. I don't know why he was blackmailing her, or um, what happened. Yeah, or he's what got happened. Those naked photos, right? And she said she didn't want to go to the police because she was afraid of repercussions. And despite her asking this HES professional for help, the claim that these pictures existed and all of that and that she's being threatened was never followed up on and nobody really investigated it. What year is this? This is 1998-ish. Okay, that's before they had the whole um, 
crimes where you know you can't post about right other oh yeah right people when, what am i thinking of the uh, revenge the, porn yes yeah yeah yes so i'm not sure you know um how he got his hands on this i'm sorry it's not 1998 it is like 2000 15. I'm sorry. She was born in 1998. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I got my dates mixed up. So it is okay. in the age of like revenge porn. But it. But she did not want to go pursue to the, it. Yeah, she didn't she want didn't to pursue, want to pursue it. it. Um, and one of the things that the authorities said, well, they weren't sure whose fault it was. Like, and I don't even understand that. Like, I'm thinking this is an HES professional, like worker or whatever that she told well, they didn't pursue like looking into it because they weren't sure whose fault it was, whether it was her or the boy. So I, which to me, that should be like plain and simple. Like it's not her fault. Like, I don't care what but she did. Maybe but, they didn't trust her. Yeah. And I'm thinking that's probably part of it. Cause like I said, she was difficult and she was always classified as being problematic. Right. Like in the reports. And so, you know, no one really dug deep to find out what was really wrong with Becky. So... No one, you know, she's not getting really the help that she needs. So regardless of all the struggles that Becky went through, she really tried to live like a normal teenage life. So she's about 16. She has a boyfriend. His name is Luke, and he's not the boy that was blackmailing her. Um, Becky and Luke enjoyed playing video games online. They were in constant contact with one another, as teenagers would do, like over texting. They texted a lot. A lot. Yeah. Luke was a year older than Becky, and he was in college, and this is, like I said, 2015. Um, it was clear that Becky was just completely head over heels for Luke, and their relationship really helped her confidence. Like, he really helped to draw her out of her shell. So on February 19th, 2015, Becky returns home to her house in the morning after staying the night at a friend's house. Angie said she was, she saw Becky that morning. She chatted with her a bit before Angie left around 11.15 to go a.m. to go to a doctor's appointment. Luke had heard from Becky the night before, but he hadn't heard from her yet on February 19th. And he was starting to get really concerned. Because they're probably always Oh, texting, probably always, right? Texting. From the second they wake up to the second they go to you sleep. You don't respond to someone's text in five minutes. Right. They're like, what's wrong? Well, even five minutes. If you're not responding in 30 seconds, right? right? My wrong? daughter does that to me. What's wrong? Are you, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, are you okay? Are you still alive? Is everything all right? Uh, I'm, getting, yeah. I'm getting anxious. Like, I have a life. I don't yeah, respond right, right away. Right. But anyway, back, you know, teenagers, I get it. So he's starting to really become concerned. Becky wasn't replying to any of his messages. In fact, he noticed they weren't even being delivered because, you know, you can see that on your phone sometimes when messages are delivered. So is her delivered. phone is off? Is yeah, that possibly. That That's what he thinks. Like, what the heck is going on? And as more time grows that day, Luke's becoming more and more worried about his girlfriend, and he decides he's going to head over to the house to check on her. At about 5 p.m., he went to the house, and he knocked on the door, and... A girl answers it, and her name is Shauna, and she is Becky's stepbrother, Nathan's girlfriend, okay. Shauna. So Luke asks Shauna, you know, have you seen Becky? Has she been around? And Angie's home by then, and both Shauna and Angie tell Luke that Becky wasn't home. They even checked their bedroom to be sure, like, she wasn't home, and while Angie thought it was weird that Becky wasn't responding to the text messages, because, of course, Luke's like, I've been texting her all day and she hasn't responded. She told him, I'll, I'll let Becky know when she comes home that, you know, you're looking for her. And I'll let her know as soon as she walks in the door. She needs a tracker. Yeah. Like I do with my kids. <laughs> exactly. On the phone. Exactly. Know where they are at all times. At all times. A big brother in the sky. I know where they are. Becky never returned home, though. And her family ended up reporting her missing the next day, February 20th, at about 4 p.m. So it appeared that Becky had taken her phone, her laptop, and her tablet with her wherever she had gone. So all of her electronics are gone. Did she have a car? Um, I don't think so, no. So she didn't, somebody had to have picked her up. Yeah, somebody had to have picked her up. There were no clothes or money missing from her bedroom. I don't know how you know whether money's missing, but... 
That's what was reported. My kids have a little jar. Yeah, (laughs) with their cash. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) So you'd know if they were dipping into it. Luke told the police that in the days leading up to her disappearance, Becky seemed relaxed and just overall, and she seemed happy. So it wasn't like she was running away. Right, like running away, like, you know, we broke up and she ran off. But he's like, no, she was doing great. You know, she was happy, it seemed, and everything. He saw Becky just a few days prior and... Everything seemed normal, he told the police. He said that they played video games in Becky's bedroom the last time they were together, you know, like they often did. And Luke Is that and, what we're calling it these yeah. days? <laughs> playing video playing games. Playing video in the games. <laughs> yeah. So Luke and her family told investigators that it was just really out of character for Becky not to return text messages or return phone calls just to be out of communication. So they know something's wrong. Due to her long history of anxiety, they were also adamant that Becky just wouldn't run away on her own. Like, she couldn't even go to school. She's not not leaving, right, right, on her own. She's not going anywhere. She just hated to be alone. Becky's best, best friend, Courtney, described Becky as someone who went to bed early, stuck by her routine, and never really went anywhere without telling at least one person, right? So she's a pretty responsible kid, and she sounds like she's a homebody. She doesn't want to go anywhere. Becky was described as being about 5'1". She had long reddish hair. She was possibly wearing a puffer-style jacket. And when 24 hours passed and there still was no new information, Becky's family went on the news. When was it? Who's the last person to see Becky? Um, it ends up being Nathan. Said oh. Nathan and Shauna said they okay. were the last ones because um, Angie had gone to that doctor's appointment. Okay. Okay. So the her parents go on the news and they beg, you know, the public for just to report anything. Like, have you seen her or anything? Friends and neighbors came together to do their own search of the neighborhood and the surrounding areas, and they didn't find anything. And at this point in Becky's disappearance, there wasn't any evidence that led police to believe that she was in any harm. You know, there was really no, like, no signs of a struggle, no no anything that would give them any indication other than, you know, she left on her own volition. Did Sean and, and Nathan say they saw her, like, leave? Or? I'll get to that. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Curious. So police searched a pond in a park that was St. George Park, which was near Becky's home. I mean, they even searched that. They didn't find anything. They searched a nature reserve called Troopers Hill that was about two miles away from Becky's home with no luck. On Saturday, February 28th, so this is now about nine days. Nine days. Yeah, after she disappeared. Um, two people were arrested in Becky's disappearance, but... Becky still hadn't been found, and they end up being released. They they didn't have anything to do with it. I'm not sure what the evidence was. It doesn't sound like it was anything strong. No. Her friends and family were fairly confident that they knew something bad had happened to Becky, but they still were all really hopeful that she was still alive. From the get-go, although her phone, laptop, and tablet were missing, missing Becky's social media was inactive, so again, that seemed very odd for her. So I'm yeah, thinking she was teams updating their... her social media like constantly. And so then, it, then the thought becomes, well, why did she take all her all of her electronics if they're not if she's not going to use them? Yeah, if she's not going to use, them. use them. Like that just seems really strange. So her parents are like, hmm, like Angie and Darren are just like, what the hell? Like we don't understand. And Becky's friends kept showing up at the house, like wondering about Becky. So now they're like, okay, she, she took her electronics. She's not using them. And then her friends are coming by. So she's, she's not, not seeing with, her friends or yeah, talking to them. Yeah. Like, so where could she possibly be? The police first turn their attention to anyone, obviously, who's close to Becky in hopes like, you know, they can find out more information. So, the initial interviews that they have with, like, the family and stuff, it's just low pressure. Like, they're just looking for information. And they're just trying to get to know Becky and maybe her, you know, routine and what activities she did. Try to, they were trying to really just get any type of lead. So through these interviews, police discover that Becky's stepbrother, Nathan, and his girlfriend, Shauna, were at Becky's house 
the morning of her disappearance, and they were the last people to see her. And it was like it wasn't Angie. So right away, Nathan and Shauna are raising red flags for the police because they're the last ones, and that's usually who police will focus on. Right, like, right. okay. From the start, it was really difficult too to get them down to the station to be interviewed. So police were wondering, you know, if you didn't have anything to do with this and if they were truly worried about Becky, like why wouldn't they just cooperate? Yeah, like come right in and say what they knew. When police finally got Nathan and Shauna to come in to tell their accounts of what happened the day Becky went missing, more red flags started appearing. Nathan Nathan and Shauna were separated for their interview, and both of them seemed to have a really calm demeanor, despite, you know, Nathan's stepsister's missing. He seemed at ease during his interview and even just like comfortable. Like you're at the police station and he's just I'd comfortable. Be, I wouldn't be comfortable. I wouldn't either. Even if they want to talk to me about going through a stop sign. I know. <laughs> I know. Like I police know. just make me nervous. And I'm a lawyer. I know. Like I, don't, I'm like, I don't. I need a lawyer. But he just seemed really calm and cool and, you know, comfortable, like easygoing at the police station, which the police are like most people, most normal people are like, like us. Like, have that kind of reaction. Yeah, you get anxious. Yeah. Shauna was similar. She was she, she was bubbly, they said. She was bubbly. even cracking jokes. Who the jokes. fuck is bubbly at the police station? When and you're there an to interview be interviewed. For a missing right? Person. It's crazy. So, it was apparent to the police almost immediately that their story was almost a little too perfect. Okay. It all matched up. Yeah. They had clearly spoken to each other prior to their interview to make sure that their story was, like you said, it fit together perfectly. So although detectives have this feeling in their gut that something wasn't right, but there's no evidence, right, right to point to anything. Did they search the whole house? They like end the up searching. Scene? Oh, yeah. Am I getting ahead? Yep, you're getting ahead. It's okay. Nathan and Shauna told police that the more that morning they phoned Angie and asked her if she was home. When she said yes, they went over to the family home because they don't live with Angie and Becky and Darren. They live about a mile away at their own place. So they're like, hey, are you home? Yep. So they come by, and they said they never saw Becky with their own eyes, but they did hear the front door slam sometime after Angie left. Okay. And so they just assumed it was Becky, like that she was leaving, because they were the only ones that were in the house. That's all they said. Police knew, you know, okay, we're going to have to do something to get more evidence because that's the story they were going with and they were sticking to it. Hmm. So after nine grueling days and no sign of Becky, a forensic team finally went back to Becky's house that she shared with her father and her stepmother in hopes they could find something, some kind of evidence that would lead them like something, something, something. give them something to work with. Exactly. And they ended up finding something. Oh. This is when they found their first real clue. A very small blood splatter was on the door frame that was leading to Becky's room. To the naked eye, it would have been really difficult to see. There was some that were some that was down low. Like it is it's a splatter. So there's some that's like down low on the door jam, some at waist level, and then about shoulder height. So just little specks. And in the blood splatter, there was some fingerprint. There was a fingerprint left okay. behind. So they're like, okay. Um, you know, they not only were Nathan and Shauna significant witnesses because they were the last people to see Becky alive, but they were also being evasive. And this was making the police weary. And so they collect this and they collect this blood evidence and they get the fingerprint. And they're hoping, you know, something's gonna break. And because Nathan and Shauna were being so elusive they decide they're going to focus on shauna she's going to be the weaker one yeah they're hoping that she's the weaker weaker one one. right that she's going to cave and tell them what happened so she comes in for a second interview and she told police the whole situation was actually quite difficult for nathan you know he's having a really hard time is what she tells police because he was close to his mom and becky and angie were close and it's being really you know it's really hard on his mom and he's really going through it But simultaneously, the police were also interviewing Nathan at the same time, and he was giving a totally different account of his family dynamics. He told police, 
he doesn't really talk to Becky and he doesn't really like her because of the way he claims she sometimes talks to his mom. So maybe she was being sassy or disrespectful or something. And Nathan was unable, though, to think of a specific time that Becky was rude to his mom, but he just felt like she was. That's what he's telling. Disrespectful. Yeah, disrespectful. And this raised even more red flags for the police, but it wasn't enough to detain Nathan. Yeah, what are they going to do? They yeah, can't because they get that fingerprint. Right. Because Nathan and, you know, Nathan and Shauna now are giving different accounts because, you know, Shauna's saying, oh, Nathan's totally broken up and whatever. And then Nathan's like, I don't really even like her. Right. So. But still, even if you don't really like her, it's your you know, I know. stepsister, you're going to care that she's right? missing. Right, you would think. Maybe right? you'd be upset. A little bit, at least, right? I mean, my kids don't like each other that much, but they'd be very upset if one was missing. Right, one was missing. So finally, though, the forensic team comes back with results on the fingerprint found in the blood splatter on the door frame. And do you want to guess whose fingerprint it is? Nathan. Yes, it's Nathan's. (sighs) At this point, the police are just pressed to find out what happened to Becky. And can they, they can do DNA on the blood. Oh, yeah, they can do. And they, they do. And I'll get to that. Um, Nathan, like I mentioned, no longer lived at the family home. He and Shauna had their own place. So the fact that his fingerprint was found upstairs was unusual because if you're coming to visit, you don't live there anymore, your fingerprint shouldn't be upstairs Yeah. at a bedroom. By blood. Yeah, exactly. And although they had the fingerprint... Police had to wait another 12 hours to get the DNA results to officially figure out, like, whose blood splatter was on the doorframe. So during those hours, police put together a plan of action of what they're going to do when they get the results. They decided if the blood was, in fact, Becky's, you know, along with Nathan's fingerprint, that they were going to arrest Nathan immediately for the kidnapping. Because right now we don't even know where Becky's at. So the it doesn't DNA, sound like there was a lot of blood. No, and there wasn't a lot of blood. The DNA results come back, and it confirmed that it was Becky's. And so the police tracked down Nathan and Shauna. Um, they were still hopeful that they could find Becky alive. So put Becky's maternal grandmother, her name was Pat Watts, she wasn't surprised at the arrest, and she stated that Nathan has always hated Becky, and he made it obvious So police used everything they knew about Nathan and Shauna to carefully craft questions that would not only keep them talking, but allow them to share a detailed account of what happened. You know, trying to get them like, okay, what's going on? Well, the more they talk, the more likely they're going to be inconsistent with something. Yes. Shauna was overall very confident and she was an articulate person. So it was easy for police to tell during the interview after her arrest that she was just weaving like this web of lies. Like she just was talking. Shauna was sure that Nathan. Why did they lawyer up? I don't. Because people are dumb. Lawyer up. I know. People are dumb. I have told my daughter, if you ever, ever, (laughs) I don't care what you did or if you didn't do it, don't you talk to the police. Even if, even if you're innocent, don't talk to them. Don't. Call me. (laughs) You know, call me. And tell them you want to talk to a lawyer. And I give that advice to everybody. Yeah, that's true. right. Do not. So Shauna was sure that Nathan, you know, that she, he wasn't capable. He, she, she's telling the police he's not capable of doing anything to Becky. And she would know she was there. Yeah. Like, he's not capable. There's nobody in his family, you know, nobody in the family that would hurt Becky. This is, you know... Crazy, like this avenue that you're pursuing when she's talking to the police is crazy. But it was becoming more apparent to the police that the more they had her talking, the more unsure she was of the story she was telling. Like I'm thinking they're thinking she's just talking off the like fly on the fly. Talking out of her ass. Yeah, talking out of her ass. Just they're like, okay, so they keep her going. And they said to Shauna that we know you're keeping something from us. They could see it in her face and she maintained she knew nothing. She had no reason to believe anyone, including Nathan, would hurt Becky like she's sticking to that. Nathan was much more different than Shauna in the interview. He didn't respond well to confrontation, and police wanted him to feel a sense of control and confidence before they came at him with the really hard-hitting questions. So after creating that environment for Nathan, police finally asked him, what does he know about Becky's disappearance? And there was... Was there anything that he could do to help them find her? Nathan maintained that he didn't know 
where she was. So police took the investigation one step further by searching Nathan and Shauna's house. Oh, which, they got a search warrant. Yeah, they got a search warrant. And like I said, it was about a mile away from where Becky and her parents lived. Police were still holding on to the hope that maybe they would find Becky alive, even though now she's been missing for about 12 days Damn. at this point. Good. Upon entering Nathan and Becky's home, police find out that they're hoarders. Oh, shit. Like, there is I just, love the show. I know, it's so I unfortunate. I love that show. I know. So you can, you can picture in your mind what it must look like, right? Every single room was filled with tons of trash and different things. Some rooms were completely inaccessible. Wow. Due to the piles and piles of stuff. And as police are moving through the house, there's no sign of Becky or really any evidence. It's just like all It's just a hot fucking mess. It's just a hot mess. And that is until they get to the upstairs bathroom. On the left side of the bathroom, there are things piled high. There's a microwave. There's like, yeah, bizarre shit in the, in the bathroom. bathroom. Yeah, in the bathroom. In the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's never I occurred mean, to me to do that. I know, and you could barely see the sink. So just to give you an idea. But on the right side of the bathroom, the right side of the bathroom was completely spotless. Right. Hmm. The tub was literally hmm. shining. Really? Yes. This stood out, obviously, to police because the whole fucking house it's a, is fucking a mess. mess. And you come into the bathroom, and on one side, it's a mess. And on the other side, it's like you could eat off the tub. Ugh. Okay, not that you would, but I'm just Gross. saying. Yeah. <laughs> the tub, and it was the only corner, the only spot in the house that was clean, Why is especially the... to the point of spotlessness. Why and it was easy tub? to get to, like Please. you could walk to it easily without being like, bombarded like your your trail there wasn't bombarded with garbage and other stuff so they're like okay this is weird you're gonna tell me something bad about the bathtub i will eventually so with new evidence popping up police are very careful how they're framing their interviews with nathan and shauna they wanted them to open up about what happened but they didn't want to give too much information so that they would have an opportunity to change their story So they decided as an interview team that they were not going to disclose to Nathan and Shauna Shauna what evidence they had. From their house? Yeah, from everywhere. Like the blade, they don't even know about the fingerprint or the blood or anything. Instead, they were just going to keep hinting at it to cause them to feel uneasy. Like, you know, like when they're hinting at it, you're kind of like, oh shit, what do they know? Right? Right. And be like, you know what? It was one time upstairs. Yeah. And And you you start to like give away a little bit. Right. A little bit. It's a good tactic for police because, like I said, they know that they know something, but they don't know exactly what that is. And so they're not sure exactly what they're supposed to explain away. So two days into searching Nathan and Shauna's house, the team ends up finding receipts indicating that Nathan purchased a circular saw, Hmm. gloves, goggles, and a face mask on the Friday that Becky was reported missing. Face mask. Yeah. Goggles. Yeah. And a circular saw. And a circular saw. Yes, unfortunately. This finding changed the entire investigation for the police. As now they felt very strongly that they were looking at a murder. Yeah. Not just a kidnapping. Mm. And with Nathan and Shauna now in police custody for kidnapping, police arrested them again on suspicion of murder. Or they charged him again. What evidence do they have for Shauna? Why is she arrested? For I know. Kidnapping? I think it's just that she lived there. Um, I'll tell you more. Okay. So police kept finding the kept the finding of the receipt a secret from Nathan and Shauna, but did tell them that a forensic team had been searching their entire home. So I mean, I could only imagine them probably like, oh shit, what's oh, what's in? Shit, I hope you did a good job cleaning mm-hmm. up. And this was exactly the pressure the police needed to apply. So finally, at 1027 p.m., 11 days into the investigation, Nathan told police through his lawyer the truth of what happened that day. So I'm going to tell you. Okay. And I don't know if this is bullshit because it kind of sounds like a little bit of bullshit to me. But he said that he wanted to scare Becky and put her in her place. So he got this idea to stage a kidnapping. What? Yeah. On February 19th, Nathan planned to meet his grandma at his mom's house 
because he needed to return something that he had borrowed from her. He knew his grandma would be taking Angie to the hospital um, for her doctor's appointment, and Becky was going to be home alone. Nathan said that he believed Becky was selfish, and he hated the way that she treated Angie, and he felt that that was a risk to Angie's already struggling health. He hoped that in kidnapping, fake kidnapping her. Fake kidnapping. Yeah, that he would teach Becky a lesson. So that day when he and Shauna arrived at the house, he had a large bag, a stun gun, handcuffs, tape, and a mask in the trunk of his car. What the fuck? Yeah, he had like this kidnapping kit. A toolkit. Yeah, like a toolkit. They used a key to get into the house that Angie left in a recycling box. You know, you leave a key outside your house, right? I mean, I don't, but some people do. Nathan and Shauna first went to the front room to hang out before Shauna said, I'm going to go outside and have a cigarette. She went out to the garden to smoke, and that's when Nathan decided he was going to go to his car and get the kidnapping kit. He then headed upstairs, and he set up the items on the landing before knocking on Becky's door. When Becky opened the door, Nathan was wearing a mask. Yeah. And I don't know what kind of mask it was, but it doesn't matter because masks are freaky. I think she's not going to figure it out. I know. Eventually, it's Nathan. I know. Exactly. He was unable to remember the exact, like, um, steps of the sequence events. It. Yeah, sequence of events after she opened the door. But he said, at some point, there's a struggle. And Nathan's mask falls off, obviously revealing his face to Becky. At this point, he panicked, and he decided, I'm going to have to strangle Becky. Because. Why? Because. I know. Right? Like, that's what I'm thinking. This is bullshit. Like, okay, your brother, your stepbrother attacks you, like okay it's gonna get assault and battery right? and be out in 30 days because yeah, people are stupid and i don't believe this story but anyway he then so he strangles her he puts her inside the large bag along with other items that he brought he then packed up her phone her laptop and her tablet along with a pair of shoes some clothes and a duvet cover from the spare room he took becky out to his car and put her in the trunk where's shauna Shauna's supposedly outside smoking a very long cigarette while this is all going on. Yeah, because it takes minutes to strangle somebody. Yeah, and it only takes minutes to smoke a cigarette, right? Yeah. So I don't know. He said, then he went inside and he he was going to wait for Shauna to come back in from smoking. Um, And then when he heard that she was coming back in, because I think she was like out the backyard or something, when he heard her come in, that's when he slammed the door to make it sound like Becky left. Like, remember, okay, they told the police yeah. Becky left. Okay. Nathan and his lawyer had given a written statement to police. Um, and police were going to play back a recording of the statement. And when they did, Nathan plugged his ears, unable to listen to what, you know, the reality of the, the story that he had done. Nathan would go on to confess that he used the circular saw he bought the day after he killed her to dismember her body in the bathtub at he and Shauna's house. Nathan said then he wrapped her body parts in up in various bags and boxes and he hid them in a shed in his backyard. When police asked further questions after Nathan's confession, because they wanted like some more clarification, yeah. he just continued to say no comment and he started to cry. This gruesome discovery rocked not only Becky Becky and Nathan's family, but the entire community. Police now knew what happened to Becky, but they were still leery of the statements that Nathan had made, as Shauna wasn't really mentioned, right? Like you were asking, They lived together, and he's got a circular saw in her tub. Thank you. Yeah, like uh, a saw's pretty fucking loud. Yeah. Like it's not quiet. And, you know, they, they're saying, like, sense. he he said that, he even said that, like, Shauna had no idea about what happened to Becky, even when he was dismembering her in really? their bathtub. Really? And then it was clean on top of it. Like, that would have been a red flag for me, too. Like, even if I wasn't home and I came home and my house is a fucking pigsty and I go and the bathroom's clean, I'd be like, what the fuck happened here? Right. Right. right like, you'd want right, to know. Right. Right. So they wanted to tread lightly and hopefully be able to uncover the full truth. 
it was just really hard for them to believe she wasn't at least aware right. of what happened. Yes. Yeah. Many people believe that Shauna was actually the brains behind the entire murder, and Nathan was just the one who executed it. I'm not sure why they think that. I'm not sure of what Becky's relationship with Shauna was. So now police turn their attention onto Shauna in the hopes that, like Nathan, she would tell her truth as well. Police knew that Shauna had lied about a number of things throughout the various accounts of, that she made of what happened to Becky, so they were insistent on figuring out what her true involvement was. They were unable to find any physical evidence that linked Shauna directly to the murder. But they were able to present evidence that Shauna had lied to them. So initially, they charged her with perverting the course of justice. They were desperate just to find any evidence to show she was involved. Finally, in a shocking development oh, found boy. in deleted texts on Shauna's phone, police discover a much deeper reason behind the couple's plan. Not only were there pornographic pictures of girls around Becky's age, like on their phone, but Nathan and Shauna had texted about plans to abduct a young girl and then bring her back to their home and like keep her as like a sex slave. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. So police now believe that there could have been a sexual motivation of about, you know, behind the murder, like acting out some fantasy. Right. So when police questioned Shauna about the text messages, she just answered, no comment, no comment. And despite the finding of these messages, Shauna maintained she had absolutely nothing to do and didn't even know about Becky's murder. This was until her DNA was Ooh. found on a face mask oh. that was found in a bag with Becky's remains. This could have the, been transfer DNA. Could have been transfer DNA. Could have been, but probably not. Probably not. So this was the first time police were able to tie Shauna directly to her murder, and finding this mask indicated that she did have at least something to do with, I don't know, the killing, but the dismemberment, maybe something. She would. She knew about something. So because of this. Both Nathan and Shauna were each charged with murder and perverting the course of justice. You said they got the saw and all that the same day mm-hmm. Becky disappeared. Disappeared. I wonder if they got it before or oh. after. I, I know. I wish I knew that. Did they really strangle her? Did he really strangle her there? And why is there blood if she's just strangled? Right. Why is there blood on the door? Right. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. Doorway. Yeah. There is. Mm. Missing pieces here. Some missing pieces, and I don't think we'll ever know the true story either. In October of 2015, Nathan and Shauna had their day in court. Nathan maintained that it was never his intention to kill Becky, but he killed her by accident. Sure. During court, Shauna described the text messages between her and Nathan that discussed kidnapping young girls as she said it was just unfortunate and she was being really sarcastic about it because that's a way to win over a jury, I think. On November 11th, 2015, after three hours and 27 minutes of deliberation, the jury found Nathan guilty of murder, conspiracy to kidnap, perverting the course of justice, preventing the lawful burial of a body, and possession of two stun guns. Shauna was found guilty of manslaughter, conspiracy to kidnap, perverting the course of justice, preventing the lawful burial of a body, and possession of two stun guns. Nathan was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 33 years, and Shauna was sentenced to 17 years in prison. And this is going to piss you off. Okay. Shauna only served half of her 17-year sentence before she was released on, I'm thinking, parole. It was It's released on license in the UK. Okay. Parole? Yeah. Yeah. She was released in 2023. Becky's family said that was a complete slap in their face and to anyone who loved Becky, but she's out. And I mean, how did he get the body from... You are stuck on that. I don't, because she helped him. She had to have. This is my opinion. Yes, 
It doesn't I mean, make any, nothing else makes sense. No, she had to have helped. She had to have helped him the whole time. And don't they have like CCTV footage of them shopping and getting the right. chainsaws? I, I don't know. I don't know. Were stores really big on cameras in 2015? I can't remember. That was almost nine, it's nine years ago. I don't, I don't know. know. When did the cameras become popular at Home Depot? I don't know. She's out, though? She's out. And Nathan is still in prison. And who knows the real reason? I think they wanted to kidnap her and put her in there wherever. And they, But then he says he strangled her right yeah. away. Yeah. So I don't know what happened. I don't know. And it's so stupid. He just That's didn't sad. like her. He just hated her. I, I, I guess. She's only 16. I mean, my God. But anyway. Poor Angie. Yeah, poor Angie. I'm sure she husband. felt horrible. And her poor her dad. And her poor son kills. Yeah. Right? Daughter. I know. Like, it's just really sad. So, well, thank you, everyone, for listening or watching today's story. And if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe or follow button or like here on YouTube. Um, thank you again to True Crime Daily for hosting us. Yeah. If you would like more episodes, um, we do Lots offer. Lots more billions and billions. Yeah. <laughs> we do offer. Um, you can sign up for a very small fee on patreon.com slash TNT crimes. And we release one episode to our members a week. We also release the um, weekly episode like this one ad free and early. And you can either go on Patreon or if you listen on the Apple app, you can go to the um, app and you can subscribe through there. We have a website, crimesandconsequences.com. We're on social media, but we haven't updated it in a while. No, nope, but we're working on it. We're working on it. It's a lot of it's work. It's at Hardcore True Crime on Instagram and Facebook. And I think that's all the business. So until yeah. our next episode. Don't kill each other and... Thank you for watching. Yes, thank you. That's Bye. sad. It's very sad. Bye. Bye.